Evening guys, glad you're here with us here tonight. Uh, we're gonna get going here a little bit. I wanna open up in prayer. We'll have some worship. We'll have Dave and Katie come on up and lead us in a little bit of worship and then uh, we'll dig into God's word um, and uh, consider what he has for us tonight. I wanna remind you guys, I'll remind you um, as you're tuning in here and then at the end again, but man, if there's absolutely anything you need during this time, don't hesitate to uh, reach out and um, hopefully we'll be back together real soon. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Your goodness, your graciousness, your love for us, the way you care for us, Father. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Father, for who you are. We praise you because, uh, uh, Father, that we get to have a relationship with you through Jesus. And we pray tonight, Father, as we go to your word and as we go to this time of study, that uh, you would just use me as your mouthpiece. Open up our hearts and minds um, for what you have for us. And Father, help us to leave this time together with uh, whatever it is you want us to learn and what you want us to apply to our lives. Help us to be able to focus in, um, clear our minds from those things that distract. May our worship be glorifying and honoring to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey! hey, hey. That was kind of weird, wasn't it? Yeah. So hey, <laughs> it's good to see you guys again. Not because we can't see you. I wish we could. I've, I've periodically gone by the church. I've seen some folks out in the parking lot. Man, we are looking forward. I know there's a day coming, a day coming soon, where we will get to see you guys uh, face to face. We'll get to hug you guys. We'll get to do some, uh, some um, you know, high fives, get to hug on you, and get to hear you guys sing and get to see you guys praise Jesus uh, face to face. But in the short term, we continue to encourage you guys to stand up at home, encourage you guys to sing along. And uh, some of you I know uh, have found out that you may be fast forwarding through the music. I want to encourage you, hang tight for the music and sing along. And then don't fast forward through Jason either. Hmm. Hang in there. All right? We got some great things that we want to share, some great things that God wants to do. We love you guys. Let's continue tonight like we've done the last several Wednesdays. Let's do some singing. Here we go. Palm 
Sunday they laid the branches down and the people came before you and they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to God of the highest. And that's what we want to do now. Hosanna.
Guys, as we get ready to dig into tonight, just by way of review over the last month or so, kind of where we've been, um, we went through um, Passion Week, talked about the empty tomb, we talked about what that means to us as Christians, the fact that we get to have a relationship with God through Jesus, who, who came to earth and, and didn't just die so that we could have a relationship with God, but lived while he was here, he lived and he showed us how to live and how to love each other. Um, we moved from the reality of the empty tomb and, and the significance of that regarding our hope in Jesus Christ to be able to spend an eternity with God in heaven. And we moved into a two-part series called No Fear. Um, as we went through this series, we looked at the reality that God is in control of all things, that he is sovereign, that truly he has a plan for us, that we can't add a single a uh, minute to our days, that literally our, our days, the length of our time here on earth and the content of our days was ordained before even one of them came to be. And so there's this reality that God is in control and, and none of what we see happening around us or in our world is a surprise to him. Nothing touches us that he doesn't allow to touch us. And so we can um, go through each day um, continuing to be focused on the call. We talked about the reality that that our call is still the same, that he still calls us to love God, to love others, to be a light so that others might see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. Um, that call, that reality is still the same. We talked about that um, we can trust in him and continue to move forward. Um, we don't have to be paralyzed by fear. We talked about the reality that oftentimes when the tough times come, when the stretching times come, how we react um, speaks volumes to those that are around us that are looking in. Uh, why would somebody want what we have? Why would they want the peace and the hope that we say we have in Jesus if anytime something tough comes into our lives, we respond just like the rest of the world? We really shouldn't be during this time. We know that we have a God that's in control. 
We know that we have a God who, um, as Romans 8, 28 says, works in all things for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I always warn that that, that verse doesn't mean everything will be cushy, that uh, our ways are not his ways, that there's this reality that um, everything is a matter of perspective. Those things that we deem as good for us are oftentimes those things that we think God should give us. But oftentimes the best lessons come in the, in the struggle, uh, in the uh, trial, um, and that's when he's growing us up. And, and oftentimes we know that's for our own good. We liken that to you know conditioning before football season starts to any sort of practice that, that isn't necessarily fun, but definitely we know prepares us for what's down the road. Um, tonight, I want to draw from all of those messages. And really, um, if you've been around youth group very much at all, or you've heard me speak, you know that I like to tie things together and build on what we've talked on before. And so I want to kind of tonight bring all that stuff together and build on all of those lessons that we've had over the last few weeks and all of those things that we've learned and, and taken in and, and hopefully applied to our lives. Um, I want to build on those and, and, um, and, and use those kind of as a springboard um, for where we're going here tonight. So here's the scenario. You woke up in the middle of the night. Those smoke alarms are going off like crazy. Dad's yelling through the house, everybody out, everybody out, fire. This happens sometimes. People's houses actually catch fire. Everybody out, fire, fire. You know that you've got one second to maybe grab some shoes, maybe grab whatever you can put in your arms and get out of the house before it's too late. What do you grab? It's weird when we think about scenarios like that. They kind of level the playing field. They kind of help us to understand maybe where we're at and what's important to us. And maybe what's not important to us, or at least maybe as important as it should be. Tonight, I want, to, want you to consider in your life what really matters. I want you to consider what really matters in life and even more in death. The fact that how we view eternity, how we view life after death, I want you to think about this, how we view life after death eternity really determines how we act when we're here on earth. It's flushed out in everything that we say and that we do. We're eternal beings. We were born, but we never will die. Oh well, yeah, we'll die physically, each and every one of us. It's appointed to man to be born and to die and to face judgment. We know that, even biblically we see that, but we know that physically as well. We all know somebody that we've been close to or, or in our association that has died physically. But what I want you guys to hear clearly tonight is there's much more to our lives than just this physical life. We know that there's a spiritual part of us as well. And oftentimes we try to separate those two, but they're really not separate. They're together. Oh, there's this time where we'll pass from this life to the next and we'll go on living the rest of eternity in a spiritual sense. One day we'll have new bodies. Um, we can get into that later. That's all for a different lesson time. But the truth of the matter is we will go on living. The beauty of God and the way that he's made it all and, and the way that he designed it all with Jesus in our lives is this. You get to choose where you spend eternity. And the truth of the matter is there's only two places. Well, we know where the one's at. Nobody wants to go there. Anybody in their right mind would most definitely rather spend eternity in paradise than that other place. Paradise, um, heaven with Jesus. I mean, just stop and think about that for a moment. I guess in this moment, I want you to stop and think about heaven and what you're looking forward to the most when you get there. The truth of the matter is, for many of us, I think, if we're honest, we're really not looking forward to heaven as much maybe as we know we should be. I think the reason for that is we get so caught up in the, in the present, we get so caught up in uh, what's going on in our lives right now that we don't want to leave that. 
A part of that may come from a misunderstanding of of really what heaven is going to be like. We have this image of everybody sitting around on clouds, just bowing before God and worshiping him. And there's something about that that just doesn't seem appealing to us. I remember my son Dawson has raced motorcycles for years when he was very small. He asked me, Dad, do you think there will be motorcycles in heaven? I said, no, son, I don't think there will be motorcycles in heaven. But the feeling you get when you ride your motorcycle, I think will be a feeling that we have all of the time. I don't even think we can wrap our minds around that feeling. You know, when I had my accident and there was this time, again, I don't have time for the story. I know it enters into a lot of what I'm saying, but so much of, of who I am and, and where I'm at now in life came from that time. But there were two different occurrences, um, one in the helicopter and one when I was going down the hallway to surgery that I, that I believed I was falling asleep. Later, I was told that, that they were losing me, that I wasn't falling asleep. And I can tell you that during that time, there was a peace and a comfort. And, a, and I understand at a level that, I, that I've never understood before the reality that he will wipe away every tear, that there will be no more pain. Guys, I was freezing to death. I was shaking, shivering. I'd lost so much blood and, and, uh, and I, was, I, I can't describe how cold I was and the pain. I didn't know a human being could feel that much pain and still be alive. But in that moment when I thought I was falling asleep, I can't even describe that feeling to you. I know that when the, when the attendant in the helicopter slapped me and, and brought me back and said, no sleeping, no sleeping, I didn't want that. I wanted to be left. Uh, I wanted to be. I, I wanted to be able to fall asleep in the moment because I thought that's what was happening. But what I experienced there is something absolutely indescribable. It's just a comfort and a warmth and a and an enveloping. It's like falling back into the arms of God. I know no other way to describe it, but I can tell you that it's absolutely amazing. No more sin, no more pain, no more suffering. He'll wipe away every tear, Scripture tells us. Joy that we can't even describe. I mean, I hope you look forward to that. But unfortunately, I think we get so consumed. Many of you have seen this illustration before. This red part of this rope is very small. Um, let's assume that this rope goes on forever. Uh, in fact, up here in the upper room, it does, for the most part, go on forever. Uh, it just keeps going and going and going. This little red part of the rope, let's call our entire life here on earth. You guys, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, you're somewhere in here probably. We don't know how long anyone's going to live, but... Let's say the average is 75, 80 years old, something like that. I mean, you guys are clear back here in this part of your life. And the reality is that choices you make now affect the rest of your life here. We understand that if I make poor choices, I have consequences. And those consequences can affect how I um, spend the rest of my days here on earth. Um, we talk about that even in secular circles. But the truth of the matter is, it's even more than that. The choices that I make even here on earth, as it relates to eternity, affects all the rest of this. And we can't even wrap our minds around eternity because eternity goes on forever. We have no concept of what forever or infinity really is. We think of one grain of sand on a seashore. Uh, imagine your life as one grain of sand uh, in, a, in a whole beach full of sand. Even that is, uh, is not sufficient because we know those grains of sand are numbered, just like this rope eventually would come to an end. The unfortunate reality is that, that most of us live our lives for this little red part well, this is where our focus is at, rather than our focus being on eternity. We're eternal beings. And that eternity began the day that you were conceived. Literally, 
we began. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, starting in verse 19, we read, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Guys, we know that to be true. We know that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Um, we'll look at that passage. I'll throw it up here a little bit later. But the truth is, where our heart is at, that's where what our actions dictate. Whatever is in our heart comes out in our actions. Man, if we truly believed that, that heaven was all that Scripture describes it to be, I think we would look at death, death differently. I think we would look at life differently. You know, every time somebody passes from this life to the next, we have funerals. And in that funeral is mourning. And every time that um, I see families and I work with families who are mourning over the loss of a loved one, I think, man, they knew Jesus. And if they knew Jesus, we should be celebrating. And we say that. That's the typical thing we say at the time of a, of a memorial, of a funeral. But truly, if we believed that, we believed they were with Jesus and we believed heaven was so much better than, than it is here. Sure, we miss them, but shouldn't we be happy for them? Shouldn't we be excited? You see, again, the way in which we respond and the way in which we act, it speaks to what we truly believe. And I just wonder if in our minds we have a knowledge of heaven, we've been told what it's like, and I just wonder if we truly, truly believe. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around something that we haven't experienced in the physical. We see this over and over with Jesus and the disciples. Um, they watched him do miracles, and yet they doubted when he was with them, different things. Uh, he, at different times, has to basically check them up. They couldn't heal the demon-possessed demon boy, and, and he says some pretty harsh things to him. Uh, oh, um, perverse generation. He uses an adjective before that. How long must I contend with you, he says. He watches them feed the multitudes and then they go across the Sea of Galilee and, and the thing that they're most concerned about after, after they watch him feed tens of thousands of people with a kid's lunch um, is that they forgot to bring food. We're slow to get stuff. Tonight, I want us to consider, and as we move forward in this series, I want us to really consider eternity. And my hope and prayer through this series is that when we're finished, we'll live our lives each and every day with an internal perspective, an internal focus, focused on the things of God and the kingdom to come, not focused on the immediate or the temporal. As we talked about with no fear, man, why would we fear the one who could only harm our body. Why would we fear these temporal things? Because in a flash, they're gone. And like my experience, uh, I've shared with people who have lost loved ones, like my experience, although there may be suffering and pain up until that point, when you pass from here to there, I can tell you, man, God really wipes away every tear and all the pain. And it is a feeling that you cannot even describe. I've had people ask me, do you think they suffered much? And now I can honestly say, you know, they may have suffered, but if they know Jesus when they pass from this life to the next, it doesn't matter. They don't care. It's not something that they're hanging on to that they're struggling with. Every tear and all that pain is wiped away. A couple things to stress in regards to this topic. All of Matthew 24 and Jesus' parable in Matthew 25, 1 through 13, all can be summarized and summed up by saying this. Jesus is coming back. Guys, Jesus is coming back, and only God knows when. Here's the other truth. He wants to take us with him when he does. Man, we've been talking about 
uh, COVID the last couple of weeks as we talked about no fear. Man, is this conspiracy true? Isn't it? Am I going to get COVID? Am I going to? Man, I don't know the answers to all of those questions. I honestly don't. You drive yourself crazy trying to figure them out. But one thing I do know and I know is true. Jesus is coming back. And he wants to take us with him. He's coming back and he wants to take us with him. Guys, you can take that to the bank. Until he returns, we shouldn't be bored. You see, he's given us plenty to do. And not only that, as he's called him to himself, there's an expectation that we do it. Check out Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. I love this story. It's a hard one to swallow, but uh, check it out. In verse 14, we read this again. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to the other two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, a few things I want to point out in this passage. First of all, he gave them different amounts. He gave them different levels of responsibility. Guys, a talent was a huge sum of money. There are uh, many theologians have argued or believe, historians, that a talent could be as much as 20 years worth of labor wages. Could you imagine laboring for 20 years for a talent? Even the one who was only given one was given that. The one who was given five much more and the one who was given three even more. Notice that he gave according that he gave according to his ability. In other words, he gave responsibility according to the way he had been gifted, according to um, the way he had been equipped, according to his ability to deal with it. You see, we have a God that is fair and true. He equips us for his work and gives us responsibility according to our ability. To one who has been given much, much is expected. There's this principle that we get from Scripture that we need to apply here. The master gave them something valuable, something that they could have never produced on their own. Let's continue reading in verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. I will put you in charge of many things. There's a principle we're getting from this right away. Guys, he's given us work to do. He's given us talents and gifts and equipped us through the Holy Spirit to be able to accomplish them while we're here on earth. If we're faithful in that, he will give us more to do. He will give us greater responsibility. If we're not faithful, well, let's read on. He said, come and share in your master's happiness. This answers the question. Why would I want to serve? Why would I want to do for others? Why would I want to sacrifice my life for the sake of someone else's? Why would I continue to give and give and give and give? Why, why, why? Because he tells us in his scripture that when we do these things, it comes with a joy that is absolutely indescribable, something that we can't explain. It's this reality that the joy that we seek, that we try to manufacture for ourselves with everything the world throws at us, just can't be found in that way. We always come up short. We're always left wanting. It's the Christmas present we had to have that after a week, we don't even play with it when we're children. Soon later, your, your desires will be bigger. Uh, you'll absolutely just be fixated on that perfect car or that new motorcycle or that toy or someday um, this or that or the other. You get married, you'll have to have the house and maybe furnish it. And after you get that thing or you get there, you just realize that it's just stuff. And it really has done very little to give you 
uh, or to provide you with anything lasting. It just doesn't. It falls short. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's what? Happiness. Again. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you do not sow and gathering where you have not scattered seeds. So I was afraid and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. Here's the principle. Guys, they were all entrusted with something that they couldn't have provided for themselves. They all were given responsibility. The five turned his into five, the two turned his into two, the one even turns it back on the master's head. He starts out almost by accusing the master. Man, this, this, this just reeks of even Adam back in the garden. Do you remember Adam back in the garden? They're told to eat from any tree in the garden or they can from any tree in the garden, but from that one tree, don't eat. Satan comes along, offers them an alternative, right? We talked about last week, he masquerades as an angel of light. He comes with something good. You won't surely die. You'll just be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, that sounds like a good thing. So they take and they eat. And then God comes. And they're hiding. And he says, why are you hiding? He says, we're naked. Who told you you were naked? As God begins to question Adam, what's the first thing he tells him? This woman you gave me. He tries to blame God. In a sense, that's what the master or what the uh, worker's doing here with the one talent. The master comes back and he begins by saying, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, a hard man. Oh, so this is my fault because I'm a hard man. Guys, it's interesting when we read these parables like this and we see the master. Uh, it's just a side note. Again, We've turned God into our world, in our world, into this benevolent grandfather that's never hard, that never does anything we don't like or we don't deem as good. But here, once again, in this parable, we see the master in this in this parable is God, and the servant is saying to him, the worker is saying to him, "You are a hard man," and he tells him, "You should have at least put my money on deposit." He begins with all these excuses. Guys, when do we make excuses for something? When do we start arguing our case? Isn't it most typically when we know we're guilty? Mom or dad comes home, they gave us something to do, maybe it's a chore. Dad walks in, the chore's not done, the lawn's not mowed, the room's not clean. How often do we just straight up go, you know what, I blew it. I, I just was lazy. I got caught up doing something else that I would have rather done. Mom, Dad, I'm sorry. That's no way for me to show you respect and honor. Has anybody ever responded like that? I don't think so. Mom or Dad comes back home. We haven't done what they left us to do. Or we not fulfilled the responsibility that they've given us. What do we do? We start making excuses. It might involve our brother or sister. It might involve some homework. It's going to be whatever we think is the best argument for them, right? Well, I had to get an early start on my paper. I mean, you didn't want me to late, wait till the last minute to write that paper, did you? So I started researching, and the next thing I know, the time had just gone right by. When if we're honest with ourselves, it's really laziness. Guys, we have a master, a Lord, Jesus, and he is returning, and he wants to take us with him. But in the meantime, he hasn't left us here with nothing to do. In fact, it's why he called us to himself. You remember Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork. That's like masterpiece. In other words, he painstakingly made us, designed us exactly the way he wanted us. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
I say it all the time to you guys, he didn't make you and then try to think of something for you to do to be useful. He had work for you to do when he made you. Work just for you. Let's continue reading. Matthew 25 and verse 29. Let's read on. For everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. He's talking about what we've done with what we've been given. For those of us who are faithful, for those of us who use our gifts, our talents, our faith, the assurance of salvation he gives us in the word, we put on the full armor of God. We talked about that the last couple weeks. For those of us who are faithful in that, he will give more. For those of us who are not, he will take away. Man, I, I talk, talk about this a lot, too, in regards to those of you who have incredible talents. And I don't know if you've got a talent to play an instrument, shoot a basketball, um, whatever it may be. I, mean, I hope you understand that God gave you those talents and gifts to be able to glorify, honor him, and to be able to use for the kingdom. I challenge our students all the time. What, how are you using your gifts and your talents for the kingdom? Here's the reality and the truth. According to this passage and many others, if you're not using your gifts and talents for the Lord, he'll take them from you. You see, he's given them to you with a purpose, just like we saw here in Ephesians 2.10. 2, uh, 2, Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be whip, weeping and gnashing of teeth. These are harsh words if our God is this benevolent grandfather who only gives us easy stuff, stuff that we like, who's not, who doesn't judge and doesn't punish anymore. There's this reality that he's left us. Jesus ascended into heaven in Acts 1.8. He told them, sit tight for I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And uh, when he comes, you'll receive power. And you'll be with my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That's Acts 1.8. Guys, the blood of Jesus has saved us from a godless eternity if we will but receive it. He promises the Holy Spirit who comes and takes up residence in us at the time of salvation and gives us spiritual gifts, gifts that are to be used just for, for the kingdom, for God. And he, and, and he doesn't stop there. He gives us talents as well so that we'll have a voice with those that we rub shoulders with. He makes us awesome so that we'll have a voice to tell people about Jesus. He doesn't leave us here to do it on our own. He gives us the Holy Spirit and we're promised that the Holy Spirit will give us power. Literally to the disciples, that power that can move mountains, he tells them. He strategically placed us, Scripture says. We covered that over the last couple of weeks. Even in our geographic location, even here in Eaton, Colorado, if that's where you live, or Greeley, or Windsor, or Severance, or, or California, or wherever you're watching this from, he's put you there with a reason and a purpose. Why? To be able to accomplish those good works in Ephesians 2.10 that he created, he prepared in advance for you to do. Guys, when we let fear overcome us, when we let laziness take over, when we let selfishness reign, it's like taking our light and putting it under a basket. When we hang on tightly to this life that we love so much and that's where our focus is at, Luke chapter 17 verse 33 reminds us, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it and whoever loses their life will preserve it. Guys, when we hang on too tight to what we think is so important, he'll take it from us because he wants us to give it freely. He wants us. And so where are you at tonight? Is that you? Are you hanging on tight to the grip? Do we even know? It's so hard because we have this sin nature and, and this sin nature, it's like sin goggles. Everything we look at is tainted by the sin nature that we have. And so I think it's hard for us to even see within our own lives where we're really at, what we struggle with. I think it's hard and it's a prayer that we should pray. God reveal to me where I struggle and where I'm at. Because I think the reality is 
we deceive even ourselves. And so how can you check yourself up? How can you know where you stand even tonight? Well, I take you back to that passage that we know to be true. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And again, I'm not just talking about, you know, uh, if, if I have foul language in my heart, foul language comes out of my mouth. Yes, that's one thing. But our actions show where our heart is at. We've talked a lot the last few weeks and, and really even as we talked about Passion Week and, and uh, Resurrection Sunday, that our works are not what saves us in any way. But our works demonstrate that we're saved. For truly, if I love God and his love is in me and it's overflowing, that loving other should be a demonstration of that. It should be a natural occurrence. Others should be able to see there's something different about us. And so when you take a step back and you honestly look at your life, what does your life look like? If Jesus was to come back tomorrow because we know he's coming, would you quick have to put some things in order? Would you... Hope that you could have or wish that you could have just another day to show him that you truly love him. All you have to do is continue to read on in Matthew 25 after this to see Jesus' response to um, the servant's excuses. We know excuses don't fool him. There's nothing that we can do to fool him. He won't be mocked, Scripture tells us. In Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23, we see the passage that I refer to often when we talk about even those within the church. We appear to do good things. We can uh, purpose to try to be holy, but it's not about that. It's about a relationship with God. For there are those when Jesus returns that will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We did miracles in your name. I point out that that these are those that believe themselves to be saved. They're, they're actively involved in ministry. They're working for him, so to speak, if you want to say it that way. They're believers. They're people who got their butts in the seats on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights and maybe serve on a board or maybe even are deacons or elders or, or youth staff or teach vacation Bible school or... You plug in whatever, but the reality is those works are not done from a pure heart. There's this reality that they're striving, that they're purposing to do things for God. Guys, we can't do anything for God. He doesn't need us. He wants us to demonstrate our love from a pure heart in the way that we live all the time, not just when we're putting on the show. Are you the same when you come to youth group as you are when you're home alone? Are you the same when you come to youth group as you are at school or in the locker room or with your buddies? Guys, those are all questions for each of us to ask ourselves. Because he tells them, Away from me, for I never knew you. Away from me, for you, you evildoers. There's that word evil again. You remember from the last couple of weeks, we're looking at passages in Romans even that, that talk about evil. And we think of evil being the worst of the worst things. But when we look at that list, Romans chapter 1 is a great place to look. Of all of those evil sins, those evil doers, we see even in there gossips, slanderers, right? We disobey our parents. I mean, there's all kinds of those kinds of things listed in there. It's not just those things that we deem the worst. Guys, the good news is, and there is good news in all of this, and that's what I want you to wrap your minds around or focus on. We don't have to pay the penalty for those sins. The good news is that Jesus came and he lived, remember, and he died so that he made a way that we can be reconciled to God. And we get to choose where we spend eternity, two places. You choose. You choose. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves so that no one can boast, Scripture tells us. We're saved, it says in Titus 3, 5, by the washing of the, of the Holy Spirit. Literally, when he comes in to and, live and dwells in us, he washes us clean from sin. That's symbolic of the baptism ceremony, really, or baptism is symbolic of that, rather. 
to say it correctly. Guys, faith isn't simply a knowledge of God. That's knowledge. We say, well, I believe, I believe in God. Guys, even Satan believes he's not saved. He's not spending eternity with God in heaven. No, it's exactly the contrary. Why? Because he doesn't recognize God as his authority. He doesn't have a relationship with God. He wants to be God. Real belief in him comes with action. Romans 10, 9 is our salvation verse. We share the Romans road. For we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of that sin or payment required for that sin is death, Romans 6.23. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We get to Romans 10.9. If you confess with your mouth. Guys, that verse does not mean that somebody who's deaf or mute can't be saved because they can't confess with their mouth. That confess with your mouth piece in there is the action we see demonstrated that reflects what's already happened in our heart. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. That's what it means even in our, our first verse we ever memorized, John 3, 16, when he says, For God so loved the world that whoever believes, it's all of that. It's believing. And belief is demonstrated with action. There should be something, even in the way that we live. Our actions demonstrate our faith is real. Man, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. There's a story here in Scripture. Um, as we get to Hebrews chapter 11, we call it the Hall of Faith. But I specifically want to go on down, and I want to, uh, I want to concentrate here on Abraham. Abraham is a guy that's mind-blowing to me because his faith is so great. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. I often refer to Abraham. Man, Abraham, God says, Abraham, pick up your family and go. And Abraham went. In fact, it says he got up early in the morning and went. He didn't know where he was going. That's faith demonstrated. That's, that's Abraham demonstrating what's really in his heart and going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. God simply promised to make a great nation of him. He told him to go to this land I will show you, and he went. Guys, we live in a world where I got to have all the answers before I'm going to step forward. That's not demonstrated faith. Any of us, once we have all the answers and it's all laid out for us and it seems profitable for us or it seems awesome, any of us would make that choice. But that's not what Abraham was faced with. Abraham had to go without looking. By faith, verse 11, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered himself faithful who had made the promise. He trusted God. Now, you know the story. If you go back, uh, Sarah wavered a little bit. She gave Abraham her maidservant. Um, there were consequences. They conceived. Ishmael was born. We know that that is the holy war that we see even today between Islam and Christianity. It goes clear back to Abraham because he wavered and there was a consequence that came from that that has, has marked society for the rest of time. Here we are in the middle of it still. And so from this one man, as he has, uh, as he as good as, and from this one man and he as good as dead came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people are still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things, that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Guys, 
I hope you understand what he's saying here. There's this reality that although they didn't see what God had told them they were going for at the time, they only got to see it for a distance. It didn't matter to them because their ultimate focus was on eternity, was on him. They were obedient, not because he promised them something. He, they were obedient because they knew that they loved the father. They trusted him and they knew that ultimately they would experience reward in heaven. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. You see, Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Isaac was willing to allow himself to be sacrificed. If you know the word and you do a study and you see Isaac was old enough to fight his father in this. To defend himself. There was no defense recorded in scripture. They were both obedient to the father in this. Abraham simply had enough faith in God to know that somehow he would provide the lamb for the sacrifice or that he would somehow prevent um, this thing or raise Isaac back from the dead. Abraham reasoned that God could raise him from the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead through his provision of the ram. Guys, God's response to Abraham is clear. God's response to us is clear. He's left us here until Jesus' return with work for us to do. And in that work, we glorify and honor him and we reflect. Um, guys, we purpose to be good ambassadors for Christ. We recognize that he's given us this ministry of reconciliation. But when we live a faithless life, when we live a life focused on this little tiny bit and our life is not focused on eternity, we don't well reflect Jesus. We don't well glorify him. Our youth group verse Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us straight up, in view of God's mercy, in view of the fact that he gave us Jesus, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Guys, let me point something out. The Old Testament sacrifices had to be prepared very specifically, but guys, it required a life. They were killed. The sacrifice, the ram, the goat, the, 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 the calf, it was sacrificed. It was killed. We have to die to ourselves. Remember the one that, that wants to save his life will lose it, but the one willing to lose it will save it. It's this reality that we can't hang on too tight. The sacrifice was killed. We've got to die to ourselves. Offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Notice he doesn't say our souls. Because our souls are, are Jesus. He's held them in his hand. Nothing can touch us. He doesn't allow. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. But we offer our bodies as living sacrifices every day, all day, holy and pure and pleasing to God. A sacrifice had to be prepared in a very specific manner in order to temporarily cover our sin. Uh, we have to offer ourselves to God in this very specific manner, in a way that is holy and pleasing to him, according to Scripture, Romans 12, 1. Now, Paul, as he spoke to the, to the Romans, Jews and Gentiles, like we talked about last week, both believers and unbelievers, here he's speaking specifically to believers because he's saying, in view of God's mercy, what Jesus did for you, offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy, pure, and pleasing to God. This is your reasonable act of worship. It's reasonable to think you do this because he died for you. We owe a debt. He bought and purchased us at a price. His blood shed on the cross, separated from the, from the Father and the Holy Spirit, bearing the sin of the entire world. Paul knew this was going to be a challenge in which the believers were living in Rome. Rome was a jacked up place at the time. Not unlike our world here. And what does Paul tell them? Don't be conformed, he goes on in Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Guys, I cannot stress enough. We have got to continue, especially during this time where we're separated. We don't have the accountability of each other, the encouragement of each other, 
in person. Father, we have got to, guys, continue to renew our minds with the Word of God. We know that the Word of God, taught by the Spirit of, the, of God, is the only thing capable of transforming us, of renewing our mind. Garbage in, garbage out. We take in plenty of garbage. We have to renew our minds daily with the Word of God. Notice he says, don't conform any longer. There's this reality that those in Rome had already begun conforming. I challenge you guys a lot, and I tell you that, that man, if we're not being transformed, we are being conformed. There is no coasting in our relationship with God. We don't just simply coast through any of it. If we're coasting, we're going backwards. We're being conformed. What are you doing to renew your mind today? Guys, it's extra important during this time that we press in, that we continue to grow, that, that we ask for sensitivity from the Holy Spirit, that, that we ask God to show us where he's working, that we might join him. Man, I've had questions from some of you that are reaching out and you would love to, to, to love people, to, to be an extension of God's hand. Pastor Jason, how do we even do it right now during this time when we're separated and we're supposed to be staying at home? Uh, I guess now we're safer at home. Some things are starting to loosen up. But man, it's hard. You got a mask on when you're out in public. You smile at people. They don't even know you're smiling. I get it. I know it's hard. Even more important that we press into God, that we pray for sensitivity, that we pray that he shows us where, where he's working, that we might join him. Guys, pray for his heart. Pray for his eyes. Pray, Lord, that he will show you where he's working. And when he does, understand that's your invitation to join him there. Remember, strong, healthy relationships take work. It's no different in our relationship with God. Let's pray. We'll close in a song. Father, thank you so much for your truths. Thank you for your son. I pray if there's anybody that doesn't know you tonight, they just open up their heart and say, God, I want you to come in and be Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Mold me, make me into what you want me to be. It's really that simple. And, and Father, we just pray that, that they would respond to the call that you've placed on their hearts. Father, for those of us who call ourselves by, by your name, that call ourselves Christians, Father, help us not just to talk it, but to walk it. Help us, Father, to live, uh, to be active. Father, you tell us that even as the day grows near, we're supposed to be about your work. We're supposed to be about our daily business. The call is still the same. We know what it is. Father, until, until Jesus comes back, help us to actively be involved in the work that you have for us. Father, give us your eyes for your people. Break our heart over the things that breaks yours. Father, help us to see things the way that you see them in this world. Father, help us to be sensitive to the Spirit and the Spirit's leading. We thank you, Father, for these truths. We trust you, Father, to open our eyes. Draw us to yourself, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, we love you. Stay focused on eternity, not the temporal. There's a lot more than this little red part. It goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We love you guys. We'll see you later. See you soon, I hope. If you need anything, don't hesitate to reach out. We're here for you, and we love you. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.
We love you guys. We miss you guys. Have a great rest of your week.